Hey folks, welcome to Pro Trader Strategies. My name is Eric Wilkinson. This is Swing Trades Using Options. Sorry, a little bit of <laughs> craziness going on here right beforehand. My One of my lights just fell <laughs> on top of me right before we started to go here. So sorry, I might be a little bit shaken up just <laughs> as uh, I had a bit of a disaster before we started here. So the lighting is a little bit different. Um, sorry about that. But let me get this going here and share my screen so we can all get started here and uh, get on with this show. So before I get going here, I guess uh, really, you know, if you guys find a moment where there's a light bulb moment for you, please smash that like button for me and share this information with everybody else. That really does help us out. So what we're going to be talking about here is a continuation of these type of swing trades and using options around those. So as you guys have noticed, that I have certain situations I like to implement different option strategies. When volatility is really high, I like to collect a premium because I know those premiums are really uh, pumped full of volatility. And when volatility is really low, those premiums are really cheap. So that's where we want to lean towards buying. So I've done those different extremes with volatility. Now we're going to be looking at taking advantage of a directional assumption where we really don't know where volatility is going to go and whether it's going to go higher or lower. So about a middle of the road type of uh, volatility coefficient is what I'm looking for with this one. And I'll explain those volatility coefficients a little bit better throughout this video. So what we'd like to try to do here is build from simple concepts to real life examples. And by the end of this, you guys should have a pretty solid understanding of what we're talking about here. So without further ado, uh, this video is actually going to be on the double bear spread. So what we're going to do is create a situation where a bearish assumption is what we're looking for. It is a defined risk strategy. Now we used to call it on the floor, the aso loco, which is the crazy bear um, because you're using two separate bearish strategies and combining them into one to create this massive bearish strategy. Now it is limited risk, so keep that in mind. We're gonna create it so we risk one to make one, and I'll show you how we do that throughout this video. But first, we wanna talk about swing trades, and what is swing trading, really? Uh, it's pretty simple, folks. A lot of people will talk about it. It's basically technical analysis around these underlying. So to make this simple, we're gonna start out with, we look for a bullish, right, market neutral, or bearish market action. Those are really the only three things that we see, right? And then what will happen is in that overarching uh, directional move, whether it's bullish, market neutral, or bearish, we see the market fluctuate back and forth throughout time, right? So whether it's either way, and it doesn't always hit at the exact same level. Sometimes you get like these where it's a little bit more, uh, not as consistent, if you will. But the idea is after you've seen the overall market action around this directional move is you try and then drive in some support and resistances. It doesn't always have to hit every single one, but you want to try and hit as many of them as you can for your resistance, if you will. So there you can find your support and or support level. So I'm trying to just kind of hit as many of those as I can for that support and resistance. Now, if you are newer to trading, folks, I would go for the ones that are hit the least. Now, if you have a higher risk tolerant trading uh, regiment, then go a little bit tighter and try and make sure you hit all of them. Now, if you're hitting all of them, the ones that like are breaking through it, you don't want initiate. You don't want to initiate that trade when it bumps up against it for those less aggressive traders. You want to wait for it to come back down into this trend channel, which is where this between the support and resistance is there, okay? So that's where you would initiate your trade is after it breaks back down into these areas, okay? Or breaks back into the channel here, or you see it bounce off of it and start to revert, okay? Those are where you're trying to take advantage of those moves. So first thing is the overall trend, the second thing we look for is try and figure out where those support and resistances are. Like I said, less tolerant or less uh, uh, risk appetite, I guess, 
go a little further. If you uh, seek volatility and or um, a little bit more risk, go a little bit tighter. You'll have more opportunities if you go a little bit tighter, less opportunities on the further away one. All right. So we found the trend, support and resistance. The next thing we want to do is look for that pattern within the trend. So here we have a bullish trend with a bearish pattern setting up. So we're going to set our trade up off of the rollover there. Neutral, we got a uh, bearish pattern set up and a bullish pattern here, okay? So we are going to set our trades up off of the pattern reversal, all right? That makes sense for everybody? If you have any comments or anything like that, or if you guys get lost a little bit, throw it over there in the comment section. I want to make sure you guys are clear of concept before I move on, all right? So if I don't see anything, I'm assuming you folks are digging it and catching on, all right? So smash that like button if that's happening. All right, so for instance, now onto a real life example. You can see I have Fibonacci's in there as some of the support and resistance areas. You can also draw in your lines. As you can see, you probably could have figured out these lines probably better than Fibonacci by looking at some of these tops here. But you can see we've got an overall neutral trend here. And this is an old snapshot of IBM because I've been using this through this swing trade uh, webinar as I've used this stock as a neutral trend since basically the uh, 90s folks, it really hasn't, you can pull this chart up and they haven't gone outside of somewhere between 100 and 125 for a very long time. Yes, it will break out every once in a while, kind of like what I just talked about, but it comes back in the line. So if we were gonna look at this as this swing type trade, right? We're gonna be looking at a neutral, we have an overall neutral, sorry, neutral trend, right? Now we're gonna try and find our support and resistances. So you're following these lines, right? Just kind of like what I did in the last one. And that's what we're kind of looking at, right? So find your resistance is right around in there. Finding some support, this might be a little bit tight for some folks. So you might wanna go out to this other Fibonacci where it hits these, okay? And that's where you're looking for, for those extremes, all right? Less risk tolerant, a little bit higher up here on the gold line. Uh, the red line is going to have somebody that has a little bit more uh, risk uh, appetite. So the, then what we're looking for is that then pattern reversal, right, that we talked about. So I'm going to erase this little line right there because I got it covering up what I want to key in on here. And we're looking for candles that look like that, all right, or very similar. They can be flipped up, they can be green or whatever, but there we have a candle that looks like this. We used to call, or we call those like hammer dojis, hangman dojis, where they're flipped upside down like that. You could have a spinning top doji where it's got a little bit of a wick hanging out and same thing with the top end. The idea is that these wicks are longer than those bases there. You could also have like a tombstone one. And like I said, keep in mind, we could just as well see these candles be green at the top or bottom of move. So that's what we're looking for. Those type of candles are the, for entry level folks, this is really what we're looking for. Yeah, there's all kinds of other pattern kind of setups that we can look for, uh, dark clouds and everything else. But those are the major uh, candles that folks focus on for the different reversals. Like you can see a, a reversal down here doesn't look anything like what we were just talking about, but we've got one there. Um, this is one really right there, another one right there at the top of the move there, another one here, right? So those are the ones you wouldn't necessarily see that right there. Um, and if it happens in this base area, we don't care because inside of a move, these candles aren't going to give you those signals as strong as when they're at extreme levels. Because those extreme levels, the way that these candles kind of look, you can see it's like bulls and the bears banging heads in a sense. Is they're really fighting over. The bulls are trying to push it higher and bears are trying to smash it down, right? Well, that's a key as to the psychology of the market. Hey, one of these is going to lose. They're really battling it out. One's going to get tired. We don't know who is yet, all right? If the, the bulls keep the strength, then it's not going to confirm this topping pattern that we're looking at with these different types of chart setups like that, all right? So people with a higher risk tolerance or have been around for a while 
would generally initiate a trade probably on that move, all right? But if you are newer to trading, I would suggest, highly suggest folks, that you wait for a confirmation, meaning the what the candle I've been talking about, these are all setup candles, right? Setup candles here, and then you wait for the confirmation, which would mean a red candle at the top of a move to close out below that previous day's low there. So that that would confirm a top, okay? That's what you're looking for if you are waiting for that confirmation, a red candle. Uh, the next day you get a green candle, that is not a confirmation. That means that pattern is broken. So I was looking at a couple of examples because we're looking at an ASO loco, right? We want a big bearish trade here. So I'm looking at deer and all of a sudden I'm just flipping. All I do, you guys, is go down my watch list. I don't even care what the stock is. I'm just looking at the charts and looking for these types of patterns here at the top of moves. And this is at the top of this move almost perfectly, right? You can see that there's a resistance area there and a support area there. And if you were a little bit more aggressive, you might hit that support level in, in here. Uh, I don't, I'm sorry, I'm not drawing very straight lines here, folks, but uh, the idea is that's come up near that resistance area. It's losing that momentum to the upside. Listen, folks, when the stocks get up near those highs and you see those candles, that's usually where we're seeing that type of action. Here's another one where back in the day, it got that confirmation. And then lo and behold, I was like, you know, I've been using this IBM example for quite some time and uh, we'll take a look at that in a moment. Uh, again, this was that pattern setup that we were looking for. I was looking for the setup candle, which is this one right there. I was looking for that setup candle. It did not get confirmed. It blew off to the upside. I have a tendency to be a little bit more aggressive with these. I look for those setup candles and don't always wait for the confirmation, all right? Especially when I pop, when it pops into my head and I see it like flipping through the charts and all of a sudden I get one of those at the top, I'm usually gonna jump on it. Now, with this trade, we talked about this as an example in these videos where I was selling calls up here at the 175 level for a short call at one, uh, sorry, at 137, sorry, dyslexia. And now you can see I sold the, calls here, the market blew off to the upside and hit the second resistance, which was right there in and around that 137 area. That's why I picked that strike for one, it fit my rules. We had high volatility, it allowed me to get really far away from where the underlying was trading. So that's why we like to use options is because it gives us more wiggle room. If you had gotten short IBM right here, that would have been a painful experience. But I'm not saying that this wasn't a little bit painful with my short calls, but I had a resistance area well above where I was in order to get tested. Yes, I did get tested, but on the day I was tested, we beautifully got another one of those candles. If tried to test this resistance area, failed. Very important. Tested a resistance area and failed uh, on that day. Next day, confirmation on that move. Um, so this trade ended up working out for me. Yes, it was a little bit painful. No, I did not add to this trade when it was uh, pinching me. I just stayed with it, played out the probabilities and it ended up working out. Um, so, you know, a trade gone against me but still ends up working out is pretty nice. Now, this is back on IBM, back in those uh, charts there. There's the one that didn't get confirmed. Here's where we were talking about the rollover in that trade. On the earnings, it got a pop. Yeah, it got up to 152. I don't know if IBM's ever traded up there. It probably has, but not very often. And then it started rolling back over to these support areas that we were originally talking about. Now, I started talking about this as a bullish move on that trade because IBM, if you are newer to trading swing type trades or want to get into learning these candles, IBM is a great example of that because it gives you those great candles and it also really stays in this range between 100 and 130. Yeah, we'll break out a little bit higher like we've seen there, but for the most part, that's just getting a little long in the tooth there. Uh, so we can see it got gained, gathered support down here in and around this 115 area. And then sure enough, 
we get the blast off to the top. This was just in a matter of months and we're right back up to the resistance area. And what's it giving me today, folks? This beautiful candle that I said I was screaming for. <coughs> a big spinning top candle at the top of a move. You know, and I, I like to trade the points of control and stuff like that. So when I know it gets outside of this level, even though there's no support and resistance necessarily, I know that the value is expected down here because that's where we've transacted. If you see a lot of transacting going on, that's where the market is signaling to you it sees IBM as having value in this case. So right here, IBM's point of control is that 135 area. That's really where the most time and volume is transacted. That means that's where the overall market perceives value for IBM, okay? And I like to trade around those. When it gets to those extremes, it acts as a little bit of a magnet here where it's kind of drawing it back down, you know? The folks that got long in and around this area are dying to cover once it gets, you know, pulled over. And it's, it's kind of like a self-fulfilling prophecy that it falls back to those areas. I mean, as you folks probably know, you've seen that often. I don't and maybe even without the point of control, you just have this number in your head because it always trades there. Well, that's the same idea is uh, folks out there when they've seen that price trade a lot, there's not a lot of anxiety around that price because they're so familiar with it. But anyway, I'm looking at this for the Oso Loco. We've gotten all of the things I've been talking about in this entire webinar series with IBM and we've got another brilliant setup setting up for a bearish uh, pattern. We're looking for that bearish pattern within the overall neutral trend. And I've already still have, I still have all of my Fibonacci's in there. So um, they're still holding true. Now this is the deer trade. I was all, this was the original trade I was looking for, for this specific webinar because of this pattern setup. And then I got it in my head. I was like, you know what? I need to update some of these IBM ones and boom, IBM just jumped out at me. So that's the one that I really want to use as the example here. I do still have the uh, deer stuff if you guys want to look at that too. All right, the Oso Loco, the double bear spread. Why are we picking this spread? Because the way that the volatility is set up in this, and this is where I'm talking about down here at the bottom, this volatility is what determines price in the option montage. Yes, everybody will tell you, the longer duration options are more expensive because of the theta and that's why they are pumped up. But what I'm talking about in any given underline, this volatility, implied volatility is different for every single stock. IBM and Tesla do not have the same implied volatility range. And implied volatility for an underlying folks is kind of like this swing trade that we're talking about, but it's always a neutral bias. All right, where it will have areas of extreme volatility and the volatility just can't support uh, or the, the, the underlying can't support that kind of volatility. People start selling it and it rolls back over. So IBM, a high of 35 implied volatility or 0.35 in this case is uh, really low for something like Tesla. Tesla probably never gets that low. So. That's why we have to compare apples to apples. I have to compare IBM's implied volatility to IBM's implied volatility, okay? I'm not comparing volatility to something else to determine if it's high or low. That, that's mixing apples and oranges. But with this one, I can see it's at a relatively elevated level. Now, I would expect when we get up to this level, right, that it's gonna lose momentum and start rolling back over. All right, that would be a theory to sell premium, right? If I thought volatility was gonna come out, as volatility come out, comes out, it affects those premiums. Every percentage point, those premiums in the option montage start lowering every time volatility down ticks. Vice versa, if volatility continues to ratchet up, my pr prices in the premiums are gonna go higher. So I've got a conundrum here, right? I can't really sell because I'm worried about volatility also going higher because of earnings, right? Volatility heading into earnings 
has a tendency to make that volatility go higher. You can see that volatility starts spiking ahead of these earnings here, right? And that's kind of what we're seeing here. Can, can it continue higher? Yes. I'm a little worried about that. I'm not going to lie with this trade, but I expect it to come out. So what I'm trying to get to folks here is I want to isolate this. I want to make sure volatility fluctuating doesn't hurt me. And this is why we would implement something like this around this type of volatility when it's right there in the middle. And I call it around 50 IV percent. You know, it's not at the extreme high and it's not the extreme low. It's right in the middle there. Uh, Cause you guys know that, it, that have watched a lot of these videos that when the volatility is above 50%, I want to sell it. All right. Above that 50% mark, I want to sell premium because I expect the volatility to come out and that premium to come out. When volatility is at those extreme low levels or, you know, 50% or below, then that's where I'm thinking about buying. But what do I do when it's right there at 50 or just, I really don't know. This is going to be a thing where we can isolate that volatility here. I'll show you how we do that. All right. So when I was talking about volatility, implied volatility, you're know, like, yeah, Wolfman, you don't say it. There's no implied volatility on this page. Well, just so you know, the Greeks, this is implied volatility. And I'm just going to write implied vol. Vega is volatility. All right. It's a Greek, not a Greek, whatever you want to call it. Vega is implied volatility. You'll see that same numbers in and around there. Now, with this said, because I'm isolating volatility, I'm also really going to be isolating theta decay as well. So that's not going to hurt me in this strategy either. So therefore, I want to go further out in time, give myself time to be right. I have that earnings in there. I'm probably not going to hold on to this trade through that earnings. But just so you know, you might as well go further out in time. For one, it gives you more time to be right. Two, one of the rules with my strategy here is the fact that we need to make sure that, um, that we do this for a credit, all right? At the end of the day, when we build this strategy out, we need to at least do this for a credit or a scratch. And I'll, the reason has to do with where the break even lands. And I'll, I'll show you that here in a moment. But just know, if the only thing you walk away from this, the, the also loco, you got to do it for a credit, all right, or a penny. A lot of times it'll build this strategy out, especially with the, the bearish one here, because puts have a tendency to have a little bit more premium in them. It'll try and build this out for a debit. I would crank that number up, get it to a credit or just no outlay of cash, all right, uh, and let that work. Now, I say that, I tried to do that this morning and it didn't work out for me. I didn't get this trade off. Uh, I had it queued up and the market ended up not working out for me. So I, I didn't end up getting this trade off uh, fast enough. All right, but volatility, what I'm talking about again, and I know I'm looking at this put spread one, but what I wanna talk about here real quick is when volatility upticks goes up by one percentage point, that's where I'm talking about. This goes up to 20 from 27 or 28 to 29. Then 11 cents goes into those pre, all the premiums there and the corresponding uh, like here, this would go into that premium and this 24 cents would then go into those premiums. All right. So if volatility upticks by one percentage point, that corresponding Vega will add into all of the premiums, even over here on the put side or call side. All right, those corresponding premiums. And that's even if the underlying doesn't move, folks. Underlying doesn't go anywhere and that volatility starts increasing, those premiums will also increase. Now, the nature of the strategy, we're gonna offset that though. Uh, but I'm just trying to give some of those folks that may have not had an opportunity to uh, see some of the previous videos, that information. All right, so when we build this strategy out for the ASO Loco, the double bear spread, I want to start with the put spread, and that is a long put spread. I'm trying to take advantage of a bearish move with a long put spread. So here you can see I bought the uh, 130s, and I'm selling the 115s, all right? The total debit on this trade, and I did this yesterday, 
was 238. Now, my thought process is on my other bearish spread, I need to collect the credit to pay off that premium, all right? So I want to sell a call spread and have that give me at least $2.38. So the short call spread is bearish and I'm collecting a premium that will pay for my long put spread, all right? So I don't have to lay out any cash other than my margin. So I've, I've got this 238. Now I go over, well, here's the um, your analyze tab. Just keep this in mind how this kind of runs and goes below. So 238, your analyze. And then if I go over to the call spread and back to where I was talking about, I'm buying the 145s because I'm trying to make this equal distance. Oh, one of the, sorry, I got a little ahead of myself, folks. Some of you folks that have paid attention to these videos throughout and been here for all of them, I've done a video on the long call spread. I've done, and this is actually a short call spread. Short call spread, sorry. Uh, the short call spread pays for the long put spread, all right? So they're both bearish spreads. Now, when we were doing this for the long put spread, I said you needed low volatility, right? For the short call spread, I told you you needed high volatility. So get those levers and pulleys going together, and you know that when we're right at the middle of the road, that's why we're matching those two up, okay? For a bearish directional assumption, because I don't really know which direction volatility is going to go right now, or at least I just don't have a good grasp on it. So I want to isolate volatility. And by selling this call spread, you can see, so, oh, sorry, again, I got ahead of myself. When I'm doing the call spread and put spreads, one of my rules is going right around that 30 delta, right? I'm usually a little bit more aggressive on the uh, long spreads. I get a little bit closer deltas, maybe about a 40 delta closer to that, the monies. But for this one, I'm looking right around for that 30-ish delta. So you can see that that's what I was looking for in this strategy as well. All right. So right around that 30 delta is what I want to initiate the strategy around. You can go a little bit tighter. Don't get me wrong. You can go a little bit tighter and you can uh, increase that risk a little bit more, but you're also increasing your reward. So I don't have a problem with somebody doing the 40s or something like that. That's just a little bit more aggressive than what I was looking for generally on this strategy. So I usually look for that 30 delta. This is like a re great question, Saul. This is like a risk reversal, a risk reversal, but we are defining the risk across the board on it. Correct. Um, John's asking, uh, what was that? Oh, sorry. Uh, is it the 130 put uh, or the one? It's the 130 put is the one that I used in the previous example. This is the one where I was buying, sorry, <clears throat> buying that put. Thought I still had my pen. Buying this one, buying the 130 and selling the uh, 115, buying one of those to sell one of those. So I made mine $15 wide. A couple of things with this as well. When we're doing these call spreads and put spreads, um, we are looking for, you know, I, I usually say you go about 10% is your, your defined risk. So in this case, we're looking at $140 stock. I went $15 wide, okay? So you get gauging it that way, all right? That's where I kind of start out with. So that's why I picked the $15 wide there, all right? Uh, $15 wide, the 30 delta, and then it's usually getting defined at around that 16 delta, all right? Is what we're looking for. And you can see here, collect credit of 241. Very similar in nature to the uh, put spread, right? The long put spread directionally bearish. That's how we make our money. Uh, but then when we drag these together, this is what happens. It creates the uh, analyze for this strategy. And you can see that right here, because I'm doing this for a slight credit, the break even is near the calls, okay? So that's the difference here. If you're 
doing this for a credit and why I made it like try to make it really important to get that credit in the strategy is so that your break even is by the short calls, right? These short calls way up here, right? Here's where we're currently trading. My break even's here. If I do this for a debit, folks, that break even shifts from here to the puts. So where do you want your break even on a bearish move, right? I want my break even up here on a credit. And this is a debit, right? That's pretty obvious that we wanna make sure we get a credit. Even if it's a one cent debit, folks, your break even is down there by the puts. One cent credit break even is up there by the calls, all right? So try and do this. That's why I was like, make sure you're doing this for a credit so that break even line is well above from start, okay? So in this case, like just to go back again from last night, I'm looking at starting with the puts, <coughs> defining it, find my 30 delta, right? Defining it about 10% wide, which is $15 or as close as I can get there. And then I go over to the call spread and I'm selling a call spread to collect enough credit to pay off my long put spread. So that's why it's a double, or we used to call it the Oso Loco, the crazy bull. You're throwing two bearish spreads together to create a bearish directional move. Um, but define, like uh, Sal was saying, is that the risk reversal would be non-defined. This, this one would be defined, okay? So better for a lot of reasons that way. You don't have that kind of risk though. Not as quite as much reward, but definitely don't have that risk. And then again, I just did the analyze tab as if I had built it out normal. The other one, I just kind of slapped those two together, left it in there. So we have our defined risk strategy in both directions. And this is for the IBM trade there. Does anybody else have any questions so far? All right, now <clears throat> I wanna talk about this a little bit because of our strike locations. and. Folks, delta is equivalent to the probabilities, okay? And when you have a standard deviation curve like this, these are probabilities of what would happen <clears throat> on a regular standard deviation curve. So in a sense, on that analyze tab, this is kind of like where we're looking at. This is the starting point, all right? And then everything else around this is 50-50. Whether it goes this way, it's 50% chance, or this way is a 50% chance, right? Now, technical analysis, I will say that we believe that we can turn those probabilities a little bit because we see the support and resistances. The idea here is when you're trading at any given moment, when you enter that trade, you have a statistical probability of 50-50 of a winning trade, right? That's the facts. And that has to do with the moment that you put it on, right? How often have you put on a trade or bought a stock and it went two or three ticks against you? Maybe a dollar, two dollars against you, right? That happens. It's a 50-50 probability at the moment you put this trade on, which is why I like options because that doesn't often happen, that you get it immediately directionally right. Options allow you to get that little bit of wiggle room. Like with this one, I have a flat line for a little while before I have to worry about losing or making money. And that flat line where we were looking at those defined risks, if this is the puts, this is where we're buying a put and we were selling a call at around that 30-ish delta. And how do I come up with that? Well, basically you're adding up all the percentages out this way. This ends up being about a, uh, actually my 30 deltas out here. Uh, sorry, this is a 30 delta. This is around a 36 delta there. So I'm trying to get out here on the calls and should erase that. I'm just gonna erase it because it's confusing. This is wrong, Wolfman. 
So is this. So what I'm looking for then is the 30 delta, which is basically 15 plus nine, we got 25, we got 31 ish, 32. It basically ends up being very close to around 34, 36 delta right there. All right, I'm gonna call it a 36. All right, so right around 36 ish, 34 is probably closer. And then this is right where we're looking for our 31 deltas. And then the 16 delta being right around there. So really what we're trying to do is hope that the market just takes off down to that 16 ish delta. All right, we don't have to worry about anything after that. We've got defined risk strategy. This strategy will immediately start to work out if you get the directionality right, folks, because we are, remember, this is our long put spread over here. And we didn't pay anything for that, right? Because I sold that call spread to pay it off. So every move down that way is going to start making the strategy work out quickly. We don't even have to get necessarily to our long put for this to start making us look like we're geniuses. Oh, I got a little, I want to, sorry, I'm trying to pull up my chart and uh, what was I going to look at? So I wanted to show you guys a chart of what happened today with IBM. A lot of you folks probably started checking it out and you can see, I tried to get this for a little bit of a credit there, um, about a seven cent credit, which was a little bit juicy, I guess. The market did start moving there. I was very close. I thought I was going to get hit and then the market started falling <clears throat> and I did not chase it because right now, if we were to look at this trade, we can see it was a massive winner today. Um, uh, where is it? There it is. So I just pulled it up as a opposite order. Like I said, I did not have the opportunity to get on this quick enough. But you can see I did that for the original three cent credit. Now, folks, remember, when you get that three cent credit, you get to keep that. All right. Even if you lose money on the trade, that three cent credit really is offsetting some of your losses. But if it is a winner, you're gonna get out of this for an additional credit, all right? And that may be a little confusing, but the reason why is we didn't pay anything for a long put spread. And if I get out of a long put spread for a dollar, right? I get out for a dollar credit. So this trade working out you collected a credit to begin with, and you will collect a credit to get out if you are directionally right, okay? The put spread and the call spread on the normal distribution uh, wasn't clear. Can you go over that uh, again with the deltas? Yeah, I'll go back there again in a second, all right? Uh, so here you can see the market has made a substantial move to the downside. This put spread is what's gaining in value. And at the same time, this call spread that I sold is decreasing in value. So I'm getting double bang for my buck there, right? So that's why it's the aso loco because you're, you're doubling down here in a sense, all right? Uh, it doesn't really hurt you. You're not necessarily really increasing your risk a ton, but you know, you're, you're all, whatever you're increasing your risk in this trade, you're increasing your reward. So it's an equal 50, 50, uh, outside of the three cents I collected. All right. So this trade started really making that move quickly. All right. So let's go back to this and I'll erase everything and start over. Cause I probably confused everybody with it. Erase all. All right. <clears throat> so basically, when we're looking at these lines, you can see the standard deviation moves down here at the bottom, right? <clears throat> this is a one standard deviation to the positive, a one and a half standard deviation, two standard deviation. The half standard deviation, to figure out what the standard deviation is, for instance, this two standard deviation, in order to figure out the delta here, you have to add up all of these numbers. So let's say we got 1.7, 0.5, and 0.1, that gives me 2.3, right? So a two delta is really what that, maybe a two or a three delta is really where this line comes in, all right? And then if I go to the one and a half, I add that two plus this four, so this is right around a six delta, all right? 
this, all of this, plus this nine right here, that gives me about a 15 delta or 16 delta is what I like to round it up to, say it's a 16 delta, all right? And then the 16 plus the 15, you know, it, it really ends up being around 34 when you get the three standard EA4, all of that out there. It kind of starts getting closer to 34, which is makes this, you know, about a 31 just inside of there, okay? Is the rule of thumb there. So this is the puts where I'm buying a put somewhere in that 30, somewhere between 30-ish and 34-ish is where my sweet spot is on that. And then we're defining it at that 16 delta, all right? So we've got a really good probability of success because actually if we do this for a credit, our success begins here. Because we did it for a credit, we get to keep that credit. So if it just trades right here and stays there the whole time, then I still get to keep that three cent credit. Don't get me wrong, it's nothing to write home about, right? But know that I have all of this to be right, and if I do it for a debit, then I only have this to be right. Does that make sense? Because if I just stayed right there, I paid a debit, I'm gonna lose that debit. So that's why it's important. Do you get out when the short, uh, the short call goes in the money? Um, for me, Sal, that's a great question. I usually will define, let this, uh, if it's a defined risk strategy, start to play it out. But having said that, we're doing this on a swing trade. So I'm gonna have to scroll back, guys, to try and find this uh, first chart, which is gonna be a mile away, I guess. Um, is this IBM? Uh, yes, the IBM chart. Um, so, Sal, with this trade though, for me, you know, if I'm doing this on this setup trade, I would be getting out if the pattern is broken. So, right there, that's the setup candle, right? If today we had gotten a move that just like, you know, rip your face off rally is what we used to call it, where it just kind of rips the opposite direction you're expecting and started moving like this, that's not confirmation, right? That means that the pattern's broken. So a settlement above that previous day's high or your setup candle is where you pull the ripcord. Don't even, you know, mess around with it, all right? Just start pulling that ripcord, which is gonna be very close to that short strike in this case. Uh, and then the other thing is on a winner, like if the market starts moving because we're doing this on the swing trades, right? That if the market starts trading down and I got the confirmation, then the idea is you're out, you know, if it did this another day, you're out above the previous day. So the next day, if I started getting uh, a market that wanted to go an opposite direction, I would play it to where you start opening and this green candle looks to close above the previous day's candle. That's where you're out on a winner. Does that make sense? All right, perfect. Thanks. Um, so that's the idea here. Wait for those confirmations. If you are newer to trading or newer to swing trades, I like to get in. I'm, I'm a pretty aggressive trader, so I usually get in on those setup candles. I like I tried to get in today and it didn't work out. Uh, had I noticed that yesterday, I probably would have gotten in yesterday, though. <laughs> um, so does that answer your questions there, guys? So look to get out above the previous day's candle, especially like uh, with this candle that we saw today, right? in this trade, then the idea is if we start going above today today's candle, that's where I'm getting out of it. It's got to settle above there. I could easily see this market want to rally tomorrow after the big sell-off last few days, but you got to also think that these folks want to cover at least some of that profit before the earnings. So I think we'll see some rollover there. We'll see. Uh, I, like I said, I was not able to pulled the trigger on that fast enough and it kind of got away from me. 
So, uh, folks, if you guys haven't taken advantage of this, this is the offer for today. We're going to be giving you guys for 36 bucks. You guys get all kinds of content over 15 hours here. So, uh, when you're watching these videos, you don't have to go in order. So you can literally watch one of these videos and just check it off. It, or actually, when you watch it, it'll show you how much of the video you've kind of watched already. And then uh, it'll check it off once you're completely done with that um, there. And I'll throw that in the chat window for you. I see a couple of questions popping up here, so I'll get to those. So you don't necessarily have to wait for the drop uh, to go to the short put, right? Yes, exactly. Like, so today, when we're looking at that trade, um, the market moved, you know, it, it did go down there and close to testing that 130 put, right? But it never got in the money. And this trade is already up $150. Right, and that was not even the best part of the day. The best part of the day, it was up like almost 300 on this move to the downside. So if it even goes all the way to my short strike and the short put, you can imagine that's all the way down here at that support level. That is a massive winner on a one lot, all right? And it's because you paid off the debit of the put spread. Um, uh, same methodology and principles for the Toro Loco. That's right, Sal. That's right. You are a little ahead of the game. Basically, we're going to be covering the Toro Loco tomorrow, or sorry, uh, Thursday. And yes, it is very similar in nature. You probably won't have to wag it or wiggle it or finesse those prices as much with the Toro Loco um, as with the Oso Loco. The good one, Sal, is all over that. We'll be talking about that next week. And then, you know what? This is one of those, there's so many option strategies out there. This is one of those that used to be one of my favorites. And, and, and when somebody would quote one of these in the pit, everybody in the pit would be like, the Oslo Loco! You know, and uh, it was pretty fun. But uh, this used to be one of my favorite trades. It always just ends up getting on that back burner and I forget about it, but it's such a great trade for especially middle of the road volatility. So um, it's all fun. <laughs> the Aso Loco. Well, yeah, Sal's asking about the Toro Loco, which is the crazy bull, um, which we'll be doing next week. So guys, take advantage of this. Uh, before you go, please smash that like button for me. It really feeds these bots that runs out and shares that content with folks that look like you or believes looks like you or would want to know about this stuff so please do that appreciate all the comments for you folks that weren't here for the live i will circle around uh and make sure everybody's questions are answered uh in some of these later videos I actually get a notification when you guys pop in late and say hey uh i've got a question so i will get to you on that and subscribe if you guys want to watch these uh spot the trade videos that i do in the mornings it's not a consistent it's when I see it, so um, I kind of pop in unannounced. If you want to participate in those, make sure right next to that subscribe button, you got the bell lit up. The bell says, hey, this dude's just popping in. I'm, I'm letting you know, whereas the subscribe will just tell you when something's going to happen, and that's not necessarily when I'm going to do it. <laughs> that's right, the crazy bull. <laughs> all right, that's all I got for you, folks. Hope you had a great, happy new year, great holiday. And looking forward to a great 2022. If you can't take that, take it easy, folks. And bye for now. Thanks for all the comments. Appreciate it.